Bojo, welcome to Wasa Distance Education Center's radio Zoom classes. This is MVF3C, grade 11 college math. I am Bronwyn Slate. If you'd like to participate live today, you can call the Wasa studio at 1-800-465-7144 or 737-4017. You can listen on the radio at 91.9 FM or on the television at Bell Express View channel 972. You're always welcome to join me live through the Zoom link, which is available from me, your teacher, and also from your DEC. Our classes are scheduled on Monday through Thursday, 11 till 12 in the morning. And we are now in week eight of our nine week course. So we're wrapping up pretty soon. At this point, you should definitely be submitting some work for marking. So a reminder what to submit, the support questions, the ones marked with a pencil icon are not for marking, they are just for practice. So you decide which ones and how many of them to do. If you're understanding a concept, feel free to skip questions. If you need more practice, let me know and I can send you more. The answers are at the back of your booklet, so check your work to make sure you're on the right track. However, mistakes have been found. So if anything isn't uh, lining up or making quite sense, let me know and we can check to see if that's an error. The key questions, the ones marked with the key icon, are the questions to be submitted for marking. So please do all of these questions and showing all of your work, your steps, your thinking, so that I can give you credit for all of your understanding. And then also that I can understand if you are misunderstanding something or struggling with something, I can understand where that might be happening and help you out. In order, so there's three ways to submit your work for marking. The first is to scan and send your work in electronically. So you can scan your completed work in um, through the phones, through your phone. If you have a smartphone, you can use the iPhone Notes app or the Android Google Drive app. You can also just take a picture if that works better for you. You can then send it to either by email to studentwork at nnec.on.ca and CC it to um, me, bronwyn.slate at nnec.on.ca or you can message, send it to me through Facebook Messenger at vslatewasa. The second method is to drop it off in Sioux Lookout. So we have an outdoor mailbox at our address 74 Front Street, where the big red building next to the post office, and we have a small white mailbox next to our side entrance. We currently are working remotely, so it may take me a couple of days to get your work, but I'll get it back to you as soon as I can. The third method is to head it into your DEC. Your DEC can send your work through the express or fax it to 807-737-1732 or toll-free fax to 1-800-463-7852. If you have any questions or concerns, if you're struggling with anything or something's not lining up, please get reach out and get in contact with me. This is why I'm here. You can email me at bronwyn.slate, which is spelled B-R-O-N-W-Y-N dot S-L-A-T-E at N-N-E-C dot O-N dot C-A. You can connect with me through Facebook. My name there is B Slate Wassa. You can call and leave me a message at the main office. My number there is 807-737-1488, sorry. Or you can call toll free 1-800-667-3703. I'll get back to you as soon as possible. And my hours currently are Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. If you'd like to connect with me on social media, my Facebook and my YouTube are both under the name Be Slate Wasa. So find me on Facebook or subscribe to my YouTube channel because all of our radio Zoom classes are uploaded shortly after airing live. And I upload them to YouTube and share them on Facebook. So that's a really easy way to access uh, the replays of our lessons. And there's also short videos explaining common errors or confusing concepts on my YouTube channel. So that can be a great place that if you're struggling with something that isn't quite related, or in our course booklet, um, it can be a good place to go and look first if there's something there that can help you. Math is an incredibly visual subject. So seeing the replays is really gonna set you up for the most success or watching it live. If you can't access the videos through YouTube because of uh, your, email, uh, sorry, your internet is not very strong or stable, let me know and I can send you a USB key or something with the, all the replays on it so that you can still access them. All right, we're on day 28, week eight of our course. 
and we are looking at lesson 18, which is data distri distributions. So our learning goals for this lesson is that at the end of this lesson, you can say, I'll be able to create a histogram and I will understand how to identify common distributions of data. Success criteria are that you can say, I can create a histogram using intervals and frequency tables, and I can explain the differences between normal, bimodal, skewed left, and skewed right distributions. All right, let's activate our brain with some mental math. At this point, hopefully you know a fan of the mad minutes that many of us experienced in elementary school. They really just didn't set us up for success. They created lots of anxiety in students and made us feel unable to do mental arithmetic. So instead of doing focusing on those sorts of things, we develop strategies that are transferable to various situations and that use friendly numbers that we're comfortable with in order to do mental math and arithmetic. So our question today is, 724 divided by 12. And we're going to use the strategy of partial quotients. So this strategy, I do like to write down. You don't have to, but I do like to write it down to keep myself organized. And I'm going to write, it's like a long division. So 724 underneath my division sign divided by 12. And then I have a big long line down the right of my division sign, kind of like a big, huge seven. So I'm thinking how what friendly groups of 12 go into 724. And all these questions I don't prep beforehand. So I don't actually, I haven't done this yet. I am doing it on the fly. So I'm gonna say, well, 10 groups of 12 are gonna be 120. And I can see that that definitely fits um, within my 724. So I subtract that away because I've dealt with those and I have 604 left. So I know that another 10 groups is gonna fit. And so that's another 120. And now that I'm subtracting 120 from 604, we can use some of our strategies. So 100 from 600 is gonna be 500. And then I still need to subtract 20. So 500 subtract 20 is going to be 480. And then my ones is still four. So I'm going to have 484. Okay. So I can see that another 10 groups is going to fit. And I actually can see that another 20 groups is going to fit because I know that 20 groups is 240. So I can take that away and I get 244 left. So I can see actually another 20 groups fits. So another 240 I've dealt with. So I'm taking that away and I'm left with four. So I can't make any more groups of 12 with four. So I have 20 plus 20 is 40 plus 10 is 50 plus 10 is 60. So I have 60 groups with a remainder of four. And that's how we use that system instead of doing long division, though it's very, very similar to you friendly groups of um, our divisor. All right, mine's on. Let's see what prior learning we need to know for this lesson today. So we need to know what does data do and in what ways does it matter the most? So why are we even focusing on this really? So data identifies the relationship between two variables. It allows for the prediction of future and for forecasting based on the previous trend of data. Patterns can be determined in data sets and it can detect fraud and anomalies. So really the point of data is to look for patterns so that we can understand what has happened and what is likely to happen in the future so that we can plan for that. We also need to know what a frequency table is. So a frequency table refers, or sorry, frequency refers to the number of times an event or a value occurs. So how many times something happens. We use tally marks to you collect this information. So it's really important to know how that works. So each of these little green lines is equal to one. And when we get to five, we do, we cross them on an angle. So we have one, two, three, four, and then we cross it on an angle for five. So we know that each of these groups is five, so we don't have to count by ones, we can count by fives, which many of us find a lot easier 
um, to do. So I can just look and say, okay, well, that's 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 25 plus 2, or 2 more than 25 is 27. And so I can see that really easily. So we use these frequency tables to organize data when we're analyzing it. Right. What does activator learning and explore these new concepts of today? So when will I use this in real life? Looking for patterns in math helps us better understand the world around us. So as I said, data is really the analysis of patterns. It's really seeing what patterns are happening in the world around us. And so us as students understanding that means that we can understand the world better because we can see the patterns and we can understand what that means. So here are some examples of um, how statistics can be displayed. These are all histograms, which we're going to dive into with the how we create those. But we can see that here in sports, so one example in sports, how data is shown is that the distribution of an NFL player retirement age. So you can see that most NFL retire, people retire um, around age 33, 32, 33, 34 is when most of the people who play in NFL football uh, retire. Of course, there are some people who retire earlier and some people retire later, but the majority of people retire in that age range. So we can see that from this graph. We can also see the second graph um, of test scores. So we're comparing for students who studied and who didn't study and their, their marks on the test. So we can see that some students who study, most of the students who didn't study get below 50 and they sort of cluster around 20 to 30 in their marks. Some do worse and some do a little bit better, but most of them do worse. They tend to consistently do worse below 50. Whereas those folks who do study, they, it isn't guaranteed they're all gonna get the same mark, but they're clustered around, we can see between 80 and 90, the majority of students who study get marks in those ranges. And then it ranges from 60 to 100. Then we have a third graph, which is comparing the yearly income of people and the relative frequency. So how many people there are who have that. So we can see in thousands of dollars, these incomes, most people, are clustered at the lower end of our income range. So most people are earning, say, below $60,000 a year, somewhere between zero and $60,000 a year. And as we get higher and higher and higher, we're getting less and less and less people. And then our fourth uh, graph is, this is deaths in Australia in the year 2012. I mean, it probably follows very similar in everywhere else in the world in every other year. But we can see that as people get older, most people die later in life in terms of between 80 and 90 or 95 is when most of our most people die in Australia in this particular year. But in general, uh, that's what happens. So there's also, interestingly enough, a little bit of a spike in the year zero so that uh, we get just inf different information about that um, looking at this graph. All right, so distribution, distributions of data. So this typically takes into account the range and the spread of a data set. So we've talked about range before. We've talked about mean, median, and mode, which will come up a little bit again um, in our previous lessons. If you haven't checked out those previous lessons and you don't know about those topics, I would say go back and check those other lessons out. And they're usually represented by histograms and dot plots. We're going to look particularly at histograms. Uh, dot plots are something else that we're not going to cover, but that is something if you're interested, you could look into as well. So what is a histogram? And this is on page 14 of your IL book. So it's a graph using bars to represent frequency distribution. The bar height shows the frequency, so how often something occurs. And there's no spaces between the bars. So a bar graph is where you can see distinctly the bars separated and histogram, they are all connected because it's continuous data. So it's all the in-betweens. There's no in-between. We have information about all of the data. So for this, we have, you can see this example, we, the number of visits to the library and the number of students. So the number of students, so you can either go to the library once or twice, three times, four times, five times, six times. You can't go two and a half times to the library, either you went or you didn't. So it's continuous data. And so at one, 
we can see that students went, there were four students, so our bar goes up to four. Twice, this, five students, three times, eight students, four times, nine students, five times, back down to three students, and six times, one student. So we can see that in our histogram. And we have a frequency table that uses that information so we can translate that into our histogram. So how do we actually create a histogram? So here we have an example where we have finishing times of marathon runners. So we have, it looks to be like 18 different times that range from about an hour and a half to five hours, it sort of looks like to me, sort of gazing over that. So we have our, I've created time intervals already in my, because um, our first step is to organize our data into a frequency table so that we can then cluster it into groups. So again, we're not, when we're creating histogram, we're not gonna plot each of these points individually. We're gonna put them in unified um, groups, intervals. So intervals that are of the same size. So I've decided my intervals are gonna start at one hour and 30 minutes because my lowest one is just above one hour and 30 minutes. And then I'm gonna do uh, 29 minute intervals. So I don't go from one hour and 30 minutes to two hours and then two hours to two hours and 30 minutes because then if I landed right on two hours, where would that go? It would fit in two different places. So we're gonna go one hour and 30 minutes to one hour and 59 minutes. So anything that follows in there, we would tally here. So we would say, okay, let's look at our data and we see, okay, we have a whole bunch of different ones. We have, and so then we tally them. We have 132, 152, 157, 142, 156, 133, 132, 148. So we have eight different times that fall into this interval. And so we write a tally of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It doesn't matter what order we're not. We're just tracking, we're just counting how many they happen and we're not ordering them. And then we look at the second interval that we created. So it's the same amount of time, it's still 29 minutes. So two hours to two hours and 29 minutes. Again, we look through here and we cross them off where we find them. So two hours and one minute, two hours and 13 minutes. So we have a two in that interval. Then from two hours and 30 minutes to two hours and 59 minutes. So we look through here and we see 2.42, and 252. So again, we have two. So from three to 329, we had three hours and zero minutes, three hours and 10 minutes. Cross them off, we've got two. Three hours and 30 to three hours and 59 minutes. So if we look through there, there's actually none. So we can, we're just going to leave it blank. And then for four hours and to four hours and 29 minutes, there is one. Oh, here it is, four hours and three minutes. So we have one that falls in there and then four hours and 30 minutes and over, we have three last timelines, our time intervals. So five hours, four hours and 57 minutes and four hours and 40 minutes. So then we have one, two, three. So that's how we create our tallies. So we've organized all information. We've made sure we haven't missed anything. And now we gather that in our frequency. So we're just counting how many. So we have five and three, so that's eight. And and two, 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 zero, one, three. So looking at our tallies is really easy to organize and then we write down our numbers so that we can then graph our information. So that's step one is to create a frequency chart. You may need to create your intervals depending on the question. If you need to create your intervals, you need to make sure that all of your data falls within your intervals. You don't skip any intervals. So because we have three hours and 30 minutes to so three hours and 59 minutes, that didn't have any information. It didn't have any data in there. We didn't just leave it out. We needed to say that there was zero because that was information that we could use. So we can't just leave out information that has zero if it's between our overall. We didn't put anything between, we could have, but we didn't, we chose not to do something before um, one hour and 30 minutes because that was our earliest time. And we didn't have to keep going after four hours and 30 minutes. We stopped at that point because that um, sort of, because all of our data is contained within that, those ranges, but we can't leave out anything that's in between our ranges and all of our intervals have to be the same size. That's really, really important to remember. 
All right, so then step two is to choose our axes. So now we're gonna actually draw. And I've, re I've copied over our graph with just, our, sorry, our table, with just our time intervals and our frequency. At this point, the tally isn't useful to us. We have our intervals and we have how often it happens. And those are the two things that we're gonna graph for histogram. So our time interval is our horizontal axis. So like our X, the one that is flat, and our frequency is our vertical, is our like our Y. So our time intervals are always our, our X, are always our horizontal, and our frequency is always our vertical. So our time intervals are in hours, and I've labeled them. In order for to save space, I've labeled them uh, numerically. So I went 0 0.5, 1, 1 1.5, 2, 2.5, 3, 3.5, et cetera. Um, you could have written out hours and minutes, but this just seems simpler for my space. And you can see that I've labeled on the line um, where my, my interval is, but this is gonna be, so the space between zero and 0 0.5 is the time that would be between zero and 30 minutes. So from one 30 minutes to one hour and 59 minutes is gonna be between from 1.5 to two. So my bar is gonna be in that space. All right, and then my vertical axis is my frequency. And so then again, I've labeled, I write, I draw my hash marks and I've labeled it one, two, three, four, up to nine, uh, because I have frequencies from everywhere from zero up to eight. So that just is how I label them out. Again, your scale needs to be consistent so that you're not jumping over because I don't have any fours or fives. I don't just leave them out. I need to put them there to make it so that my scale is proper. Obviously your scale between your intervals and your frequency do not need to be the same. They can be different depending on the data, but they need to be consistent within themselves. All right, step three is to plot your frequencies in touching bars. Because remember, we're talking about intervals. So first we say, okay, we look and we say, so from one to one and a half, <laughs> I've made the mistake and I have put it in the wrong spot. This should be one over. So everything's gonna be shifted over, my bad. Um, so that is a frequency of eight. Oh, so frustrating, mistakes happen. Okay, so shift, all of this is gonna be shifting over uh, 0 0.5 interval. I just made a mistake. Okay, so imagining that this is between, that everything is shifted over, over, this is eight is my bar. So my next one is two. My next one is two again. My next one is two. My next one is zero, so I leave it. Then my next one is one, and my last is three. So even though there is a zero, so it looks like there's a space, it's because there's a, a value of zero, so that's why they're separated. But otherwise they're touching because we're going from all the time between in each interval in that 30 minutes, anything that could happen, any of those times could have happened, so that's why they are touching. Again, sorry for doing that wrong. It's important to pay attention to details. But that's how you do a histogram. Okay, so now we're gonna look at some common distributions of ways that data often falls. So the first is a normal distribution, and this is on page 16 of your IL book. So this is something that you may have heard. Normal distribution is something that we often throw around. Um, so this is a truly symmetric distribution of data. So everything is clustered around the middle, and from, from there, everything falls away, both symmetrically for, to the higher values and to the lower values. So the mean, the median, and the mode are the same and together at the center. So they're equal or fairly, really, really close because this is data doesn't happen in a absolute perfect reality, but they're gonna be clustered really, really together, really, really closely. And that gives us a normal distribution. It's unimodal, so that means that it has one hump. There's not a bunch of different highs and lows. We've got one high point. And this is called, also known as the bell curve. So when people talk about grading on the bell curve or I'm gonna, I don't know how they use it. I 
So, but this is the bell curve was one they're referring to it. It's a normal distribution. All right, so then we have bimodal, which is also on page 16 of your IL booklet. And this is when your data appears to have two different peaks. So unimodal was it had one peak and bimodal, we now have two peaks. So the frequencies are clustered around two modes. So we have two high values. It can be symmetric or it might not be, and it still can be bimodal, even though you don't actually have two equivalent modes. You just have two sort of areas that are clustered around a higher peak. And in theory, it's the idea is that you have two modes. You have two higher frequencies that are higher than the rest of them. The th third is skewed left distribution, again on page 16. And this is like a normal distribution, but it has been pushed away from the left. So that's super important to remember is that it's been pushed away from the left, not to the left, but away from the left. And this is backwards to what my brain thinks, but that's how it works. So it has a tail and the tail is on the left side of the distribution. And that's the scientific, or that's the statistical analysis. That's what they call it. They call it a tail. So the tail is on the left side and all of our information is pushed over to the right. All of our highs are pushed over to the right. And this is called a left skewed distribution. It's also known as a negatively skewed distribution. I guess I forgot to drop my graph in there. <laughs> so the negatives because our tail goes over to the negative to the lower end. And then our mean is gonna be less than our median, which is gonna be less than our mode. So if you have your values and you know that your mean is less than your median, which is less than your mode, it's gonna have this shape because your highest is gonna be your mode, but then your middle is gonna come next. And then your average, you add them all up and divide by the total is going to be less than that. And this is again called the negatively skewed or left skewed distribution. Uh, it can take a little while to remember which way is which. So just spend some time on that if you think you need to. So then we have a skewed right distribution, which is going to be the opposite. So again, it's like a normal distribution, but it's been pushed away from the right. So again, we have it such that our tail is over by the right and all of our higher frequencies are at the left. So again, the tail is on the right. It's known as positively skewed because our tail is over at the positive or the higher end. And here your mean is greater than your median, which is greater than your mode. So your mode is your highest much value and that is your our highest frequency, sorry, which is your, it's gonna be a lower value of higher frequency, which is a little bit tricky, but then your median, then your mode, then your mean, my bad. Ugh. Finally, we have a uniform distribution. This is not in your IL booklet, but I just thought it was good to mention. Uh, so a uniform distribution has, is, um, indicates that your data is very consistent. So you don't have any highs and lows. It doesn't have to be exactly the same, Sometimes you see a representation and everything is exactly perfectly the same. It doesn't have to be like that. But as you can see in this example, all of our frequencies are close, clustered around 500. So they're very similar. There's a little bit of highs and a little bit of lows, but really there's not very much uh, of a range there. So this would be uniform distribution because everything is roughly the same. All right, so now would be a good time to pause the video if you're watching the replay and to do the support questions on page 17, questions two and three. Um, I don't know where question one was. I'm not sure I missed that one. So check out for question one as well. I'm not sure what page that's on, my bad. I mean, it's not a good day for me, it seems. All right, let's consolidate and connect all the learning that we've done and then do some practice questions. So for lesson 18, the highlights for data distributions are that we have histograms, which are like bar graphs, but with our touching bars as the data is continuous. So there's no gaps. We show the data frequency in intervals. So we group all of our data instead of individual points, we group them in intervals to compare patterns. Then we have a normal distribution, which is symmetrical around the mean. We have a bimodal distribution, which has two peaks or two modes. We have a left skewed distribution, which is the tail is on the left side with the peak on the right, where our mean is less than our median, which is less than our mode. 
And then we have a right skewed distribution, which is a tail on the right side and the peak is on the left, where our mean is greater than our median, which is greater than our mode. All right, so our success criteria are reminding us that you can create a histogram using intervals and frequency tables. So hopefully that all makes sense now. And you can explain the differences between normal, bimodal, skewed left, and skewed right distributions. All right, let's do some practice questions. So number one, identify each type of distribution. So here we're gonna look at this one, A, where we have adult weight, and we have our weight in kilograms. These should be touching. They're not, just because they're the ones that I found, but now that I'm looking at them, that's irritating. Anyway, and the frequency. So we can see that we have a shape of going up to a Saturn point and then down again. So to me, that looks like a normal distribution. We're clustered around the middle is our most frequency. All right, and then this one, our school days in the month um, over the school year are all clustered sort of around say 17 or so. So you have some highs and some lows, but we really don't have uh, a peak anywhere. So this is uniform. Then class marks, we have nothing for our lower values. And then we go up and then down again. So we have, it looks kind of like normal, but it's been squished over to the right, which means that our tail is on the left. And so this is a left skewed. I really, this is really backwards to me. I really want to look at the peak, but we look at the tail. So we're pushed away from the left. The left, the tail is where we know that it's a left skewed. And then further, we have conceal weanings. So we start off high and then we get lower and lower and lower. So our tail is over to the right. And so this is right skewed. So looking for your tail for your skewed is really, really important. You're looking for your tail, not for your peak. And for some reason that seems backwards in my brain, but that's how it's defined. So it's really important that you're looking for your tail. And that's how we identify distributions. All right, the number two. The pulses of 30 people were taken for one minute and reported. These are the results. And then we have a whole big long list of numbers, which I'm not going to read off. But they range from, say, 50 up to maybe 95. So why is it hard to spot the trends in this data as it appears? Well, like I just said, it's a whole bunch of numbers, and they're just all grouped together. So there's no organization. So because there's no organization, it's really, really hard to see patterns. So I can guess, but I can, like, I just sort of guessed where the highest and what the lowest was, but I really can't see how often, uh, numbers occur, if there's numbers that occur multiple times, I can't tell if there's more than, like if there's two, if it's bimodal, I can't tell if it's skewed left or skewed right. It's really just a whole bunch of numbers that all blend together. So for part B, we're now gonna construct a histogram. And this can be messy. So, I'm going to do it. I'm left it so that I have to do all of the steps so, so you can see the process of doing the tally and the frequency and your intervals. So you're going to be able to see that it's not necessarily beautiful. If I had more time, I might use a ruler. If I was able to do that on the computer, I would do that. But uh, you're going to get to see my squiggly lines. So we're going to see our intervals and we said, okay, so I said that it went up from about 50 to 95. So I'm going to say, I'm going to start with 50 and I have to decide what I want to go up to. So I'm going to say, I'm going to go up to 59 and then I'm going to go from 60 
to 69. And then 70 to 79, and then 80 to 89, and then 90 to 99. So again, we don't want to have our intervals ending and starting in the same place, because then if we get a number that lands right on that boundary, we don't know where to put it. So then and now that I've set up my intervals, and my intervals are all the same size, if you wanted to, you could have done smaller intervals, or you could have done bigger intervals, depending on what you're looking for. But these are the ones that I chose that felt good. And I'm just going to go through and cross off my information and put them in and tally them. So 66 falls in 60 to 69. 79 falls in this one. 53 falls in 50 to 59. 81 falls in 80 to 89. 84, 80 to 89. 76, 70, 79. 76, 70 to 79. 67, 60 to 69. 64, 60 to 69. 83 goes in 80 to 89. 92 goes in 90 to 99. 56 goes in 50 to 59. 67 goes in 60 to 69. 77 goes into 70 to 79. 91 goes in 90 to 99. 61 goes into 60 to 69. I've already had four, so I'm going to cross off to get my fifth. 71, same thing. I'm going to cross it off. Boy, in diagonal is my fifth mark. 60, sorry, 86 goes in 80, 89. 73 goes into 70, 79. 87 goes across. Doesn't matter if you cross one way or the other. 71 goes into 70, 79. 67 goes into 60 to 69. 71 goes into 70 to 79. 81 goes into 80 to 89. 86 goes into 80. 89, 62 goes into 60 to 69, 70 goes into 70 to 79, 91 goes into 90 to 99, 72 goes into 70 to 79, and 68 goes into 60 to 69. And now we can say we can uh, organize our frequency. So 50 to 59, we can see that it's two. 60 to 69, so it's five, and three is eight. 70 to 79, 5 and 5 is 10. 80 to 89, 5 and 2 is 7. And 90 to 99 is 3. So then we created our frequency table. Now we're going to create our histogram. So our intervals are along our x-axis. So our intervals. And here we can jump. We don't have to do all of them because that information isn't really relevant. So I'm gonna go from 50 to 60 to 70, 80 to 90 to 100. If I was, these ones should be exact, I'm doing a rough sketch. And then our frequency is our vertical. And so I'm gonna go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Again, if I was, I should be being more exact, but I'm not being precise because I'm doing it quickly without a ruler. And then now I look at my frequency and I say, okay, so two. So this time I'm going to do it in the right place. So 50 to 60. So 50 to, is two. So that's my bar for two. Then from 60 to 69, so between 60 and 70 is my goal. I'm going up to eight. Down. And you don't need to scribble these in. It's just, I just did it. So now I feel like I need to do consistently. Uh, 70 to 79 is 10. So all the way up to 10 and then down. And 80 to 90 is seven. So from here, as you can see, your ruler would be very helpful. My bars are leaning over. It's like a leaning tower of bars. 
and 90 to 99 is three, so we're roughly there. And now we can see sort of what some patterns are. I'm really sorry that this is messy, but hopefully we can still see the patterns even though it's kind of messy. I shouldn't have colored those in. Okay, so then continuing on. Using our graph to answer each question, in what, which interval does the most common pulse occur? So let's go back to our graph and see, okay, so our most common pulse happens between 70 and 79. I don't even know, what are they measured in? For, so beats per minute. So 70 to 79 beats per minute is our fastest, is our most common, sorry, is our most common interval. And then in which interval does the, is the least common pulse? So our least common we can see is 50 to 60. We're gonna look at the information that we had. Obviously there's information that has zero, but that's not really helpful to us. So we're gonna look at where we have actual data. So 50 to 60 or 50 to 59 beats per minute is our least common interval. That's a lot easier to find using the histogram opposed to just a list of numbers. All right, number three, scores out of 100 on a college entrance exam are shown. What type of distribution fits this data? So we already have the tallies done. We don't just have a list. This notation here, what this is meaning is that this includes the, the square bracket includes 30 and the round is the end or is not included. So it's like up into 40. So here it's 30 up into 40. So instead of saying that 40 is in both these intervals, it's just before 40 is what this round bracket means um, in the notation. So we're going to collect our frequency for our tally mark. So that's 10, then 15, 17. 10, 20, 26, 10, 20, 30, 35, 10, 20, 30, 43, 10, 20, 31, and 10, 20, oh, sorry, no, 10, uh, 19. Okay, so, then again, we're going to do a rough sketch. You could just look at your frequency table, but we're gonna do a rough sketch. And so our intervals are from 30 to 40 to 50 to 60 to 70, to 80 to 90 to 100. And this is our scores. Examination scores and our frequency. And we don't have to go up to one. We're going all the way up to 43. So I'm going to go up by fives. Five, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45. Okay, so then from 30 to 40, we had a frequency of 10. So that's going to be roughly here. I'm not going to color it in this time so it doesn't get messy. From 40 to 50, we had 17. So that's going to be roughly here. From 50 to 60, we had 26. So it's just about 25. And then from 60 to 70, we have 35. From 70 to 80, we had 43. From 80 to 90, we have 31. And from 90 to 100, we have 19. So to me, this to figure out our distribution, I'm gonna sort of draw a rough curve 
of what's going on here. So to me, it doesn't look like it's normal. Like, I mean, it kind of has that clustering in the middle, but it's pushed all the way over to 70, like half of 50, or sorry, half of 100 is around 50, and it's definitely higher than that. So I would say that this, my tail is to my left. So I would say that this is a left skewed distribution. Because most of our data is pushed over to the, away from the left. So high, my peaks are at the right, my tail's at the left. So I say that it's a left skewed. And then number four, our last one, I believe, Measures of central tendency are given for three data sets. Identify a likely distribution for the data set. Explain. So here our mean mode, our mean is seven, our mode is 10, and our median is nine. So our mean is less than our median is less than our mode. So if I were to sort of think about that, that means that my, if I were to sketch it, my highest value is my mode, right? My highest frequency. So that's gonna be, is at 10. And then my median, the middle of my value is at nine. And then my mean, my added up and divided by the total number is at seven. So my curve is gonna be like that. So again, this, the tail is at the left end. And so it's left skewed. I'm not gonna write out my explanation because I've talked it through. You need to write it out to explain why um, if you're handing this information in to me because otherwise I won't know. So here, part B, our mean is 21, our mode is 21, our median is 21. So our mean equals our mode equals our median. So they're all at 21 and then our data falls away from there. So this, is a normal distribution. And then C, mean is five, mode is one, median is two. So our mean is greater than our median, which is greater than our mode. So then if we were to Think about what that means. So it means that our highest, so mode means our most frequent number. So our most frequent number is one. So our highest point is low on our x-axis. And then our median, our middle value is further to the right. And then our mean, our average is further to the right. So then we're going to have, our distribution is going to look something like that, which means it is all pushed to the left. Our tail is at the right. So this is right skewed. That's how we can figure out our distribution based on our central measures of central tendency. All right, so that's all that we have for today. So if you have any questions, please contact me. We are getting very close to the end of our course. We just have this week and next week. So now's the time to be asking me questions. Um, so you could reach out to me and leave a message at the main office and I will return your call at 807-737-1488 or toll free 1-800-667-3703. You can call or sorry, you can send me an email, which is probably one of the best ways to get a hold of me. Um, I check my email fairly often and my email address is bronwyn.slate, which is spelled B R. O N W Y N dot S L A G E at N N E C dot O N dot C A. You can also connect with me on Facebook where my name is B Slate Wassa. And I get back to those messages as well pretty quickly um, during the week. And you can find me on YouTube at B Slate Wassa where this lesson will be uploaded, loaded uh, this afternoon. Uh, we again, as we're getting closer to the end of our course, we are going to be doing a culminating activity instead of an exam due to COVID and the restrictions of not being able to gather in learning centers and such. So uh, next week we're doing review 
of all the course material. We're going to finish lesson 19 and 20 this week, and then do review of the ones of the next week. And then you'll be able to, once you've handed in all of your units, you can then request the culminating activity, which is, will be a independent, um, larger assignment that covers all of those 20 units. So watching next week, even though it's review, will be really beneficial to just sort of recap all of that we've done. Thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you have a lovely day. Miigwech. <laughs>